give them another reason to keep believing and making it seem easy. Flies, yes, move it, move it, one with the music, girl, you can do it. Dance under the stars of palm trees, come fly high with me wherever you want to be. And flow, don't let me go, don't let me go, don't let me go. <laughs> all right all right well uh thank you for having me i really appreciate it by the way i do not have a walk-up video they actually made me do this video in austin uh, when i was speaking there because uh, they wanted to sort of add some visuals there uh, but i'm uh, truly I'm honored to be here and uh really grateful for toolbox and and what toolbox stands for it's really uh, aligned with my, my values, my, my passions in general. Uh, and basically, you know, what I wanted to do is give you a, almost like this high level uh, story of my journey and hopefully it will speak to you as well, right? Um, <clears throat> as someone who is an entrepreneur, an artist, someone who thri sort of wants success in life, you're a driven guy just like me, I think some of my story will resonate with you. So let me just start in the beginning. Uh, my, as, as Tom said, this is confusing to people. I, you know, I know this. I'm Russian Chilean, right? It's a very strange combination. Uh, <laughs> so I was born in Moscow, and uh, I ended up in Chile when I was um, as, like six months old. My parents moved there to live there, and a few years into it, I was four years old. And in 1973, there was a military coup in Chile. And uh, there was a change, violent change of regime. There's tons of people who, who were, ended up in concentration camps. My father was one of them. Um, and my family ended up in a refugee camp. So I was at age five in a refugee camp. Those are my, actually my, my first childhood memories that I can recall, is being in a refugee camp and my family for fear, um, in, in fear for their lives with no hope, not knowing what's gonna happen. And we ended up getting asylum in Germany. We moved to Germany. From there, we went through just a couple of other moves. And we ended up in Africa, of all places, in Mozambique. Um, and you know, I've, what, what I saw in the first years of my life was um, a lot of despair, um, a lot of hardship. Uh, we, we briefly lived in the Soviet Union. It was a communal apartment, so we saw poverty. You know, when you share an apartment with another family, share a bathroom, a kitchen, uh, you live a family of four in two small rooms. We ended up in Africa. My dad got a contract there. And uh, we, we had a better life than the locals, but we had food rations, food shortages. We had a civil war that started about a year in uh, into, into our life there. So we saw bombings and stuff like that. Um, and then we sort of, we, my parents got a divorce that was very traumatic for me. And I end, we ended up back in Russia with my mom, my sister and my mom in Moscow, in the very sort of the height of the Soviet Union sort of gray area, you know? Same thing, shortages of food, shortages of everything. Uh, we ended up in a one bedroom apartment. I slept in the kitchen, that was my bedroom. You know, had a little curtain and a pull out, not even a pull out couch, a pull out chair. You know, it was very narrow. Uh, so that, that was sort of the beginning of the journey. Uh, there was a lot of hardship, a lot of change. I, but there was a lot of good things that happened from it. And, and one of the things that I want to put in your ear as, a, as, a, as something that can equip you is that in hardship, there's always something that you can develop as an advantage, right? So for me, I ended up learning four languages by age nine. You know, I spoke Russian, Portuguese, Spanish, and English. I was sort of forced to be around people and adapt to new situations, completely radically different situations, right? Uh, I, to this day, I don't have essentially a homeland, like I don't fit anywhere, right? 
Like, I'm not exactly Russian because I don't look one, like one. You know, I'm not exactly Latin because I have a, a sort of a, a very different worldview, although I look like one. In Africa, I was there in my formative years, but I was called white. You know, and here in America, you're like five minutes in, people tell, tell, ask me, where are you from? <laughs> exactly, you know. It's a long story. So, you know. So what happened, what happened after that, essentially, is, is um, it's something very strange. I was sort of at the right place at the right time. I went to college in Moscow, got a master's degree in economics, and I graduated with a master's degree in economics the very year the, the Soviet Union fell apart. So it's fascinating to have this insight into studying both economics, um, reading Karl Marx, and halfway into college, our professors started teaching us free market economics, uh, which is really remarkable. Um, but I was a very musical guy, so that was sort of my hobby. And at the time, I was like, ah, you know, I'm young, I'm, I'm going to give it a try. Uh, you, know, I don't have to, you know, if I fail, I fail, and I started doing music. And uh, in about a year, I was on national television with uh, my first hit sing singles. I got two or three uh, offers from record companies. And um, I ended up basically ascending to fame very, very quickly having a string of hits, one after another, one after another. I, and, um, and by the time, uh, what Tom was mentioning, I had sort of a number one hit called Our Generation, which is the one that Boris Yeltsin used. Uh, I was everywhere. My music was sounding from every disco, every radio, every TV set, magazine covers. I was playing, you know, the Red Square, you know, places like that. Um, so thousands and thousands all over the country, not only all over the country, Russia, all over the Soviet, former Soviet Union, which is a bunch of countries, right? That cultural space. And what happened when, 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 when that came, it was both a huge, strange combination of how does a sort of dark-skinned guy end up being a sex symbol in Russia, you know? <laughs> and and uh, it's just a strange thing. And at the same time, it, what, it, what it does, it, it brings all of the cracks in, from the inside to the surface. And I became very, des very depressed very quickly. You know, um, a lot of it had to do with old wounds, right? So my, my parents were, were divorced, and I, that traumatized me very deeply. So every relationship that came became more and more serious, I undermined, I sabotaged. And I treated women badly. I wasn't violent, but I, was, I drove them away on purpose. And that happened over and over and over again until one of those relationships, which is at the peak of my career, I was dating this runway model, which is what pop stars do. You know, it was a walking cliche. <laughs> That's what I'm supposed to do, you know? Uh, and I literally, in those moments, I thought in those categories. Okay, that's going to look good on a glossy magazine cover, you know. Um, and then the girl became pregnant, and I just freaked out. And I started driving her away, driving her away, driving her away, until she left, and she cut me off from my child, my oldest daughter, Diana. And that sort of was my breaking point. I realized that I just don't know how to live. And I was quite literally at the very peak of my career and clinically depressed. Clinically depressed. I was, I was playing sports arenas, and I, all I wanted to do is, is be alone and be with my mom. Like, it was that level of misery, you know? Um, and, uh, and that's when the church came along. I was introduced to this Canadian guy who started a church in Russia. His name was Andy Fleming. And uh, I, came to, I came to church with like wearing dark glasses and you know, hidden in the, in, you know, in the back row because I didn't want people to recognize me. Of course, they recognized me immediately as the weird guy with dark glasses indoors, <laughs> you know? And, uh, <laughs> and, um, and a couple meetings in, we went out for pizza, then I came over to his house and, and, um, and he had this, you know, his little apartment in Russia and, and I saw his family. And I realized there's something special in that family that I've never seen before. You know, a, a strong marriage, beautiful child, this bond. And I turned to Andy and I said, how do I get what you have? And he, says, I'll, he said, I'll teach you. 
if you're open to studying the Bible, I'll teach you. And I said, if you teach me how to do that, I'll do anything. And that's how it all turned. And it was something, it was something magical because I, I had, you know, had reached successes I never thought I would reach, you know? And it was completely empty and void. And this gave me a new hope and changed my heart. I started caring about people and more than I care about myself. You know, it just transformed me. Like a year in, I was living in this, in this apartment in Russia and, and I wanted to be generous, so I had, I, I moved in a, a former mafia member, a massive enforcer, like it looks like Shrek, who became a Christian and, and, and he was being threatened by the mafia. And I said, you're gonna move into my house, that's fine. We'll live together. So it was me, this long hair guy, and the massive Shrek guy, right? His name is Sergey. He would, he would break things without wanting to. You know, he could break me if he wanted to. And then we moved in a couple of heroin addicts who looked like Nazis because they were like, you know, bold headed, tattooed top to bottom, who wanted to escape addiction and they became Christians and didn't have a place to go. So it was like, just move in. We went first century, basically. <laughs> this is a little weird household. And the reason that was there that happened is because God had changed me from someone who wanted to take and achieve and sort of fill something that is unfillable to someone who is overflowing with the Holy Spirit and wanted to give to others. I started going to orphanages and serving kids in orphanages. And so, so many things happened after I became a Christian that didn't happen before. You know, I had all the success before, but even professionally certain things happened that were just super, super supernatural, like Boris Yeltsin using my, using my soul. That was after I became a Christian. And we were, that happened historically in a moment where we could help defeat the communists. You know, the, 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 that's, that 1996 was the last time the communists actually had a chance of winning an election in Russia. And this campaign, many credit, uh, and it was not, I was not the only artist there, I was just, I had a, a small part in it, but it was amazing to be part of that, right? And by the way, my, both my parents were communists and, and, and my dad still doesn't like to talk about my role in that turnaround, you know? Uh, he's fine with it. He's just irritated. You know, I sort of rub it in, you know. Um, but um, when we were serving orphans, we would we would organize um, events for 5,000 orphans in a sports arena, and we would bring in celebrities to perform. And I was one of them. And we would organize. And one of those one of those um, events, Michael Jackson visited. And I'd never dreamed I would have come have Michael Jackson join one of my events before. So it feels like those moments were, it was sort of a sweet spot, a meeting spot between hard work and talent and professionalism, but a life that was more surrendered to serving others. And those are the moments where God inserts himself and does something supernatural that wouldn't be achieved by talent and hard work. Does that make sense? Um, But you know, um, once uh, you know, once you start coming out from from this from this from the state of understanding how broken you are and how much you need other people, um, if is you you just realize there's no other there's no other way than allowing yourself to be used by God and pouring yourself into other people. It took me about. It took me maybe three years to, to, from the moment I became a Christian to, be, to the moment where I became more or less even normal. You know, I was just weird. You know, and it took men in my life to achieve that. And one of the hardest things for, for somebody who has achieved something, who is successful, to transcend success in, into significance is to, be, to find the humility to ask for help. Because on the outside, you can be very successful. On the inside, you could be dying. And I believe there are men in this room who are in that place right now. And what I'm telling you is, ask for help. Ask for help. And then when you do get help, listen. 
right? Um, you know, I was, you know, every, every, I, every, I had every right on the outside to brag and to sort of posture and things like that. But when I was my, with my mentor, Andy, I was like a little boy. I said, just tell me what to do. Just show me. And he would correct me, he would disciple me, he would rebuke me, he would encourage me, he would train me. But it was a lot of very small steps, you know, of, of, of the old me being transformed into, into the new me. You know, how, how are you with, with your people, your employees, your friends, your colleagues? How do you behave around your family, around your mom, around your dad? How do you deal with old family wounds? How do you do those things? That requires people walking with you. It's not this magical thing like a wand is waved over you and you're transformed at that moment. It just doesn't work like that. It's a lot of small steps, right? You know, when I met Andy, uh, when I became a Christian, I started studying the Bible, and it, was, it became clear to me that a lot of my lifestyle was sort of unacceptable going forward. You can imagine, right? You know? So we're reading Galatians 5, all the list of sins. And, and, and premarital sex came to the sort of as a, as a topic. And I'm like, yeah, I understand that. You know, I get it. You know, you have those rules, but, you know, you know what I do, right? And the answer was, yeah, we know what do this. So does that mean there's like some sort of get, get out of free, get out of jail free card for that kind of thing? I mean, I was, that, I was literally that clueless, right? And the answer was like, yeah, you know, there's just no, there's just no exception for pop stars when it comes to righteousness. <laughs> there's just no, there's no clause, there's no like small print, you know? And, uh, and I quite literally couldn't, I couldn't wrap my brain around the lifestyle, about, around repentance and about purity and about righteousness. I had no idea what courting means. How do you court a woman in a godly way? I mean, nothing. And maybe you are not as clueless as I was, but I bet you're clueless about something and you need help with something that you're not even aware of. And for me, look, I, I became a Christian at the very height of, of, of my career and um, I didn't touch a woman sensually until my wedding day, four years later. My first kiss with my wife, Deb, was on my wedding day. We've been married for 23 years, have three beautiful children. You know? And we're like in a honeymoon to this point. I could not keep a relationship to save my life to that point. And through discipleship, through obedience, through a lot of obedience, I have an amazing marriage. I have one of the best marriages I know. I mean, what a transformation. That's, through, that's not normal, that's supernatural. Does that make sense? Two years after I became a Christian, I started preaching the gospel and started leading churches. I actually phased out of my show business career because I felt like, look, I can entertain millions, but I'm not going to change a life like that. I'm like, you know what? If I have a stage presence, I might use it for eternal impact. So I started using, you know, leading churches. I led churches in, in Moscow. I led a church of 3,000 in Ukraine, seven churches throughout Ukraine. My oldest two daughters were born in, in, in Moscow. My youngest daughter was born in Ukraine. And then we moved stateside. I, I married an American. Her name's Deb. And, um, and I think, you know, what I love about this story is that everything that is in it that is me led to destruction, ultimately. Everything that is in it that is from God and community and church led to flourishing and success and significance. You know, I was able to start three businesses. Thank you. I was, I was able to start three different businesses, two different charities, uh, nonprofits rather. I planted a church in Austin, Texas 10 years ago. We planted another church in East, East, East Austin uh, just right before COVID. Uh, we have a, uh, an academy in Africa. We, uh, in, my, in my business world, I have a, we raise capital, we've raised millions for startups of different kinds. Uh, I have a marketing business as well. We serve businesses and nonprofits and churches. I've been able to do so many things. 
But all that success is sustained and growing and profoundly significant only because of the grace of God, only because of, of discipleship. You know, when I was doing this, uh, this, this same talk in Austin, I had a table where three or four of my mentors were there, and Robert Gant is one of them. And uh, these are guys who know everything about me. My fears, my temptations, my finances, my business deals, my weaknesses. These are the guys that I will call when I'm having a bad day. When it's a big deal or a small deal, they know everything. You know how much freedom and liberty you feel when you have that kind of transparency? It's transformative. And most men don't do that because we're wired slightly differently. Let's put it that way, right? You know women talk more readily. Guys are not vulnerable naturally. You have to, you have to make an effort to do that. And you have to make an effort for a sustained long period of time to reach maturity and to reach flourishing as a guy. And it, always, all, all, it almost always happens through a very extensive, small step, baby steps, humble walk with God and other people. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. So, um, I do have an ask, you know? And I'll tell you why the ask is. The ask is for Ukraine. Now, you, have a, you have a little um, printout there. I have an ask and a give, and, and a gift for you. Here's the ask. In the, um, on day two of the war, we, um, we were looking horrified at what's going on in Ukraine. And I got on the phone, and of course, I have sort of deep roots there. And, and it was one of those things that you just couldn't wrap your mind around it. It was like World War III starting, right? It's the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II. Um, Russia had invaded Ukraine. All of my friends were war refugees. Church members, pastors, just friends. They were all like in disbelief, right? Um, spending days and days in bomb shelters, not knowing what just happened, you know, one of those things. So on, do in, on day two, we sprung to action. We start figuring out what are we going to do? And we realized, just because of some of the extensive work that I've done internationally in charity work so far, that what we'll do is we'll figure out a way to, to create a network that is instant, to get aid to the refugees wherever they are. Because what, would happen, what was happening is that they would spend four, five, seven, eight days in bomb shelters, and then they would try to jump on a bus or in a car and try to get out of town. And everything stopped. The economy stopped, right? And then they start running out of food, out of out of clothing, it was sub-zero temperatures, out of gas. You know, people don't have reserves of money over there beyond a few days or maybe a week or two, running out of money, out of medicine. And you had millions of people, quite literally, flooding to the border. It took them 9, 10, 15, six, 16 hours to even get there, eight or nine days to even get beyond the border or just hide somewhere. So what we did is we built this network where we'd have people who are respected in the community, and we would wire money to them, and they would have a good accountability system locally, and they would just request aid from us. And it was like, there's a family, there's a group of people, 10, 15 people in a village somewhere, and they need this list of things, it's 300 bucks. And they would just drop them. And we helped hundreds of people that way. We've raised so far $185,000 in just over a month for the refugees in Ukraine. We, we started a center in Lviv, which is a, it's a city closest to the border, and we're starting a new one in Kiev soon. And my prayer and my ask is maybe, just maybe, there's someone in this room, or a few guys in this room, who would want to say, we'll give you more. We'll, not only will we give you more, I'll help you build this. And that's my prayer. My prayer coming in here is that God bring me somebody who has the ability, the desire, the means to plug in and help us move this forward because this thing is gonna carry on for, for quite a while. You know, the wars is just, it's not, the worst is not even here in Ukraine. And um, it took me like, um, I mean, I, I, was, I was 
I don't think I've ever cried that much as an adult um, that, than last month. Because I was on the phone with Ukraine almost every day. And you, I was hearing first person accounts of, um, of whole buildings coming down, you know, uh, of mothers of mothers collecting body parts of their children in the ruins, um, of th things like that, that are just things that you only remember from World War II movies, you know, that level of devastation. Um, and it's just massive, right? So my ask is this, would you consider helping us? And you, you can see a, a, a QR code um, on, on, on your printouts. And and my prayer is this, is that maybe there are guys here who will say, I'll walk with you, I'll do this with you, you know, on a sustained level, because we want to do this for a while. We're building something very special in Ukraine right now. And I have a gift for you. And here's my gift for you. There's a second QR code there. And there what I did is I created this framework on how to process suffering. How you can just sit down, you can print this out, and you can just answer those questions for yourself. And walk you, and it could be, it could be, you know, I'm kind of stuck, kind of suffering, just very vague, or it could be, I don't even know how to, you know, live through this kind of suffering all the way through. And the reason I wanted to do this is because I really, truly believe there, our God is a loving God, and when He allows you to suffer, which is inevitable, there's a gift and a superpower there that he does not want you to miss, right? Um, I've been through a lot of stuff. Like, seriously, think about it. I was in a military coup in Chile, a civil war in Africa, and uh, the fall of the Soviet Union tanks in the streets in Russia. Like, I'm, I'm fearful for Austin. I think there's gonna be civil unrest in Austin, it's gonna follow me, and it's my fault. <laughs> So there isn't, and there's other, many other layers of that sort of suffering, but I've been able to be incredibly successful as an artist, as an entrepreneur, as someone who serves the poor. And all of those, the, the superpowers that allow me to do this came from the suffering. So suffering can really, it can paralyze you or it can, or it can propel you forward. And there's a group of men here, and I know for a fact that every single one of you, you have suffering in your life. And some of that suffering is keeping you behind, is keeping you from reaching your full potential. And if you got to just process it well, and ask for help, and dare I ask, ask for supernatural help. So if you want supernatural results, you need supernatural help. And that is only in God, only in Jesus. And, and what I'm telling you is that's the, that's the secret ing ingredient. So you can do amazing things. You can change the world. If you just allow yourself to be humble before your God and before friends who are willing to invest in you. Um, and your life will change forever. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it very much.